Emmanuel, welcome to the show. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and Goody Vault? For sure. Uh, well, my name is Emmanuel Edwards. Uh, born in Chicago, raised in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, I started the Goody Vault April 13th, 2018. Um, to be honest, social media definitely played a part because it's kind of, it made the world a lot smaller. So I could see a lot of stuff as far as what's happening with vintage. Uh, but I, I guess I started this because I just enjoyed the hunt for like cool stuff, old clothing. But I was doing all kind of stuff, not just clothing, luggage and watches and stuff like that. But um, yeah, so the Goodie Vault is your one-stop shop for unique vintage apparel, um, vintage military, vintage sportswear, vintage workwear that's well curated by me. Every item is handpicked and presented to you in wonderful fashion. So cool. I love it. I, I love your entrepreneurial story too, because I think everybody can relate to this. Like you're going about your life, you have this kind of journey you're on, and then there comes a point where you have to make a decision to kind of like jump and take a yes. risk and do something that pretty much the world can tell you like, oh, that's not a great idea. Where's your 401k? Where's like the predictable income? That's what you should do. And instead, entrepreneurs say like, I kind of want to chase my dream and do this instead. And you, can you tell us a little bit about that story and like how you came to that entrepreneurial decision and how you decided to take a risk? Okay. Well, I'll give you a little bit of information about my background. So I worked for the Department of the Army for about 10 years, which was an amazing experience. I got to travel the world. I got to, you know, ha create some amazing relationships, which was all amazing. But like a lot of us, we have these goals and these dreams that we carry with us. And, you know, in pursuit of my career working for the uh, Department of the Army, kind of had to put that to rest for a little while. Mm -hmm. But pandemic happened. And, you know, I had a lot of time to really think and to be outside the office. So everything that I desired for myself, my goals and my dreams started to come to the surface again. Um, so January 15th, I, um, that was my last day actually working for uh, the Department of the Army, which was wow. difficult to, uh, I guess, deal with the ridicule that might come with making that decision. Because a lot of people were like, are you crazy? Are you going to leave a government <laughs> job? You know, all that, yep. all that kind of talk. But what they didn't understand is I have a dream. And I didn't, you know, it got to the point where I had to really build myself up to the point where I was bold enough to make that decision to write the resignation letter. It was difficult, but once I got the ball rolling, I'm like, I'm all in now. Let's go. Because I'd already been dealing, you know, I, it was yeah. time was up. I had already been building this thing since 2018. And now uh, it was time to give it a shot. Yeah. So from 2018 till that, you know, January 15th, 2020, you had been building. Oh, 2021. 2021. This yeah, this, this was year. this year. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. So this was like still during this pandemic yeah. state. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I mean, it was literally during the pandemic where I was like, no, enough is enough. It's time to give it a shot or I won't have this opportunity again. Yeah. You know? So Goody Vault had previously been still the like vintage clothing, but were you selling purely online before 2021? Yes. Everything was online. Yes and no. Uh, everything was online because I actually started Goody Vault. I was selling on Grailed at first, which was crazy because it was so much fun. <laughs> and, and that was like my intro to like, you know, selling stuff. And this is weird, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Sometimes I look up some of the names of my clients that buy stuff. And I had figured out that I had sold to one of the co-founders of Grail. So that was wow. like, yeah, I was like, ooh, they like my stuff. So yeah. then I really, that was some, some momentum to start like, you know, building my own website through Shopify, which is crazy. I love <laughs> Shopify. Um, I'm not getting paid to say that, but I do. Um, so I started there and then... In 2019, in, um, was it October 2019, I opened a showroom uh, downtown Huntsville. 
And that was where I began to sell face to face. So I had to learn, you know, taking appointments, dealing with clients face to face, which was a completely different experience opposed to just online sales. Yeah. So I'm curious about that that decision to go into retail because it feels even more risky because now you have a physical location, a physical expression of this like risk that you're taking, this dream that you're chasing. And it's almost safer at this stage to stay online because worst case scenario doesn't work. You just kind of like close your website. Whereas a retail store, you have a lease, you have an entire store built out. You have so much more that like you have to close down if it doesn't go well. Mm -hmm. Why did you find that brick and mortar location to be such an important part of kind of chasing this dream and building the brand? Well, the first thing was it was low risk. The location that I found, it was month to month. Um, it, it was downtown. Mm-hmm. And the owner of the, the facility, he's like, hey, look, I'm all about like helping small business people accomplish their dreams. You know, start it here. So I think the people that were in that environment were crucial in helping me yeah. get started. And I had a friend uh, from high school and college that was in there. So I would go and see him and just kind of connect with him before I had actually got a a spot in there. And I told him I was thinking about getting in there. And he told me, hey, why not? It's low risk. Give it a shot. So I think the people around me were like crucial in helping me take that next step. And then I guess connecting with people one on one, face to face is completely different. And that can completely accelerate your business if you're successful in making those lasting relationships. Yeah. I mean, that's like the key of everything I've heard this season is it's the face-to-face interaction that's so powerful with the caveat of if you can do it well, where you're creating relationships, not just making sales. How do you approach that? I mean, I feel like we can call it like a business strategy, but really it's like, a human strategy and like chasing yeah. your dream kind of strategy. But how do you approach, you know, if somebody's listening and they're like, well, how do I do it right? How do I do what we're saying really well? How do you even approach that idea of like, I'm not just here to have somebody walk in the store and try to get a sale as quickly as possible. I'm here to build long-term relationships with the community. How do you even think about like executing that? What feels like almost like a floaty tactic which is, I don't think it's a floaty tactic, but I know it's hard to like grasp what that actually looks like in practice. So for the longest, I'm going to get right to the question, but for the longest, I was intimidated by this whole construct of networking, but I guess people presented it wrong. Mm. It shouldn't be this structured thing. It's a more of a natural thing. So I think the biggest thing that really helped me was connecting with people at my local coffee shop. Uh, People at the gas station, people at all the different, just everywhere around the city, just connecting with people. Hey, I like your shirt. Where'd you get that from? You know, whatever it takes to break down the barriers for simple conversation. So one aspect that really helped me was constantly like, that's what I do daily, trying to meet new people, following up with people that I've met at different cafes, building that relationship. And now guess what? I can tell them what I do really easy. Yeah. Oh, that's you. That's me on IG. They're like, okay, great. And now we have a relationship. So I think you want to be authentic, you know, but this is also strategic as well, as far as, Hey, I'm, I'm being intentional about connecting with my community. I have a business, I have a service that I offer and I want to connect with you so that we can help each other. It's like a big network. And now you can cross audiences and you can, you know, present yourself in a more natural way, you know? Yeah. Oh, I love it so much because I feel like everything I talk about with brands is like, we're talking about data and tactics and strategy. Why don't we talk about just like being a human being? And a lot of times when we talk about brand to consumer connection and building relationships, we're always putting it through the lens of like, to get a sale or to grow your business, which is a natural outcome of if you are just treating human relationships as like friendships and getting to know people and connecting with your community. And that goes so far into 
then once they know what you do, you can tell them in a much more authentic way than being like, hey, uh, <laughs> my name is Kristen and I do this. Do you want to come to my store sometime? It it allows you to have that deeper connection. And then what I find so interesting is you mm. take this even further by opening a retail store, but making it fully kind of the showroom experience, this one-on-one -on -one experience, not coming in and having people just kind of like search through the store as they please. You've really invested in like creating a space where they get to know you and the journey of the clothes and everything. Yes. How, and I, I feel like it's kind of this like new trend. Showroom retail feels like a newer trend, but you are ahead of that new trend. I mean, you were doing this before you were only allowed to have one person in the store because of a pandemic. Why did you decide to do that showroom model and how do you kind of execute on it in a way where I think traditional retail says the more people you can get in the door, the better. But yeah. this is the opposite approach. So it, it's funny how this all worked. So first of all, the way our building is situated it's very hard for people to come in there and to figure out where the shop is. Mm. And I did not, I did not want to advertise it where, Oh, anybody could just come in because they would get lost in our building. Honestly. Yeah. So, and I'm over in the basement, good evolve, you know, it's kind of hidden <laughs> a little bit. Um, so that, that wouldn't have worked to have a shop where people can just walk in. And I wanted the one-on-one -on -one kind of relationship thing. So I guess to be honest, that really came from like other vintage shops that I would look at online, especially in Paris. Some of the shops are in Paris and Wooden Sleepers is one that really motivated me. Brian Davis, uh, he was formerly in Red Hook, New York, uh, Red Hook. Uh, he had a little shop out there, but I think he's moving now. But I visited his shop. This was back in like 2015. I carried that experience with me. Mm. I was like, this is so cool just to have a space that's curated because it, it, the experience stayed with me. So yeah. I was like, you know, I'm going to do it my way and figure out how I'm going to do it. So, so that's where it came from. A lot of other people that have been doing this a long, much longer than I in the vintage community, I kind of took little tidbits from them and created my own thing. But I noticed that that 101 experience really stuck with me. And I want to give that same experience to other people. That feels like the key right there is that like uh, the experience stuck with me. And I think that's the yeah. power of physical retail or even in a world where like you can buy anything in the world online. You can literally buy a Tesla online if you want to. <laughs> but you're not going to get a super memorable, exper memorable experience. You got it. Kind of. <laughs> we got there. Kind of like <laughs> going online and doing that experience. Yes. I think a lot of brands can make it more memorable, but that one-on-one -on -one with another human being in person, having that yeah. visceral back and forth is something that sticks with you, which then causes customers to come back. Do you see mm -hmm. that you have kind of, you know, with this approach built a very close knit connection with a lot of your customers and see them kind of coming back and rebooking with you because they just want to spend time and have that experience again? Exactly. I do see that. And I try to remind them like, hey, I'm not just here to sell you stuff. Like, come say what's up. You don't have to buy anything. People are always worried okay. about, well, I got to buy something. It's like, hey, I enjoy your company. Yeah. You're eventually going to buy something. Yeah. <laughs> but I want you to come here to see me, to just see what's new. Let's talk, especially during the pandemic. Like, because so many, so many of us, you know, we needed that one-on-one contact that communication. I mean, it felt good, you know, to, to just talk to another human, you know? Yeah. And um, yeah, it's, it's always going to be a component of my business and we all need that attention, you know? Yeah. It feels like a, like a commitment to the long play of that. Yeah. Come in and talk to me. It's okay if you don't buy anything because I trust that the more you get to know me and the more you have these memorable experiences, you are going to buy something from me one day because you're not going <laughs> to exactly. come in here 10 times and get to know me and not support what I'm doing. But that can also be a very terrifying place to be as a business owner where you are looking at the numbers and you're saying, this is my livelihood and I have to make enough so that I can you know, live yeah, the life that true. I have. 
how do you commit to that long term and not get stuck in that kind of panic of like, well, I just need to get a sale. So I got to do something quick. And like, even if it doesn't feel great, I just need to get a sale. So whether that's a promotion or, you know, pushing somebody that maybe isn't ready, it feels like you have a very strong commitment to not doing those things. How do you even balance that mindset, though, of long term success over short term kind of like dopamine hits and wins of, mm. OK, I can do things really quickly, but that's a hamster wheel a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's a good question. You know, this experience has really humbled me, seriously, because in an hour, your situation can change. Somebody can come in and spend a thousand dollars an hour. You didn't see that coming. So I think it's one of those things where I'm just trying to take it day by day. I'm trying to maximize and give each client a great experience. If you give, you receive, you know? Yeah. So I'm taking it one by day and I'm trying to like really pour everything I have into my clients. So they're like, man, I want, I want them thinking about me in the car when they leave. I want them like waking up, wanting to tell somebody like, man, I had so much fun at the Good Evolve. So if I can do that, I'm, I'm golden. Oh, yeah. And then that experience, like you mentioned, the experience you had, it sticks with you. Where then, you know, every time you're, whether it's two weeks, two months, two years later, you put on that piece of clothing, you had a good experience, like mm -hmm. they're going to think of you and Goody Vault and that experience. Heck and it's yeah. going to trigger that, like, I want to go back. I want to hang out with them. And that's that, like, you make those experiences so good. I just think about like, it's as simple as what's your favorite restaurant that you go to. It's always the one that you feel special at that like exactly in the middle of the night, you wake up and you're like, oh, I'm craving this and I really want to go. Yes, the product and the food is very important, but I think it's more about that experience and the the human connection, which is really powerful. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. you want, I love that. What's that, what's, that, what's that old cheer song? You know, where everybody, everybody knows your name. <laughs> I mean, like that is so everybody wants to feel like you come in there. You're like, hey, because guess what? I have a photo board for my new clients. I, I want them on my photo board. Sign your picture. I have a I offer free beverages. Mm -hmm. I do have a, a rack of beer in the machine, but I have like, you know, pop and stuff like that. But I want them to feel, you know, you want them to feel elevated. And then they're like, mm -hmm. man, this they're going to tell somebody about it. Yeah. And it's like, you know, you got to think about it because you want them to tell somebody about it. So definitely. Yeah. I love that. I want to touch on this idea of like vintage clothing and, and vintage shopping in general, because during the pandemic, I remember seeing all this news about like the big box stores are struggling and the malls are struggling and everybody's struggling, except yeah. for places like TJ Maxx was doing really well. And I remember having this moment of like, why in the world is TJ Maxx doing the best when they have no e-commerce, no online experience? All we're talking about is the importance of that. And somebody told me once, like, oh, it's that treasure hunt of like, when you go to TJ Maxx, you don't know what you're going to find. Yeah. And it feels like that is something that is very similar in what you do. Tell us a little bit about that. Like, what's the magic of treasure hunting in retail? So, man, this is, this is exactly what I wanted for myself as far as like that feeling of like satisfaction. Mm -hmm. um, so for, I mean, this is a huge community of people that, that are making a livelihood doing this. It's a huge like ecosystem where everybody can eat. It's enough vintage clothing out here for everybody. Um, so recently we, uh, one of my buddies, we, uh, we meet up, we fly into different cities and we just kind of road trip around and set up appointments and buy from other wholesalers and uh, vintage dealers. And it is so much fun. Oh, you bet. never know what you're going to see. You never know what kind of deal you could strike. And I mean, it's just you can never find a piece that's going to be like another piece. Mm -hmm. The wear, the fading, the staining, the discoloration, like each piece is unique and that's part of like my story that I sell. So you never know what you're going to find. And sometimes yeah. people that are selling, uh, you know, garments, they might not know enough history about it. And guess what? You might know the, I might know the information on it. So now I'm like, that's super valuable, you know? So, I mean, it's, I can't even describe it. It's a big adventure. It's a hunt, but everybody wants that feeling like, 
you discover some gold, you know, it's like a pot of gold yeah. that you find. So that's part of the, the drive for me, that experience to feel that over and over, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I love how then the product itself has an experience of its own. So mm -hmm. it has a story. Goody Vault has a story. You have a story. Your client has a story. There are so many different elements of experience happening where then that treasure hunt that you feel that you feel that passion for that, like you can hear it when you talk. My guess is a lot of customers also get like that same treasure hunt when they come into your store and it's all these different factors of passion and storytelling coming yes. together. So then that experience is like, okay, not only did I get a beer and get to hang out with a cool dude and find really cool deals. Now I also have this jacket with a story that I can tell people about. It's just taking that experience like further and further and further. How yes. have you seen like customers responding to that kind of treasure hunt feeling? So my, my ideal customer is the one that has already kind of looked up the good evolve they're kind of into secondhand clothes and vintage and they want to know more that's the ideal person so when they come in i mean they're excited they're already excited and i have to kind of i'm excited too because you you found me <laughs> we're here so we're both like all excited yeah. so i have to kind of calm myself down and then i have to find out what they're looking for but it's amazing when people recall memories of their grandfather that worked for the railroad wow. or their grandmother that was a textile worker. It, it's, it's, I mean, people connect to their own family stories and experiences. So it's kind of powerful when you can celebrate history with somebody and talk about like, you know, your history, your, your family history and people connect with those, especially, you know, military history. I mean, that's real. That's what really got me started because it's so readily accessible. It's everywhere, uh, mm -hmm. you know, vintage military clothing. So um, it's it's amazing to see it. But I think that uh, when people can attach their own family story or personal experience to an item, it's over. Yeah, uh, yeah, the yeah. Golden. Yeah, yeah. You can't leave that behind because that becomes a part of you immediately when you can like recognize yourself in another person or a story or a product, which I think is a huge, powerful moment of selling is when a customer can see themselves in the product. Yes. And a lot of brands struggle with that. And you have that power of like your products all have a story. I feel like this is like a totally left field question, but <laughs> do you have like a story that comes to your mind when you're talking about these like cool family histories or someone who connects with a piece? Do you have one that like comes to mind where you're like, this was such a cool experience to watch this person find a piece like this? Oh man, let me think. <laughs> I didn't prep you for this question. No, no, this is all. This is all good. It's a great question. Uh, I don't want to leave any good stuff out. Watch tomorrow. I'm gonna be like, man, I should have told that story. <laughs> um, but I guess this was our earlier sale um, of mine. But it was a guy in Belgium. So I had oh. found this helmet. Yeah, it was crazy. I was like, he found my store. He's in Belgium. <laughs> but. So it's a helmet that I found. It was a beautiful, like 1970s uh, fighter pilot helmet. It came with the flight bag, the oxygen wow. mask, and it had these really cool checkered like stripes on the on the top of the helmet. So I kind of teased online a little bit, and I said, "I'm sorry, this item is no longer for sale due to the historical significance of the piece." It was bait. It was bait. Yeah. But I still yeah. left it on there, you know. So this guy sent me a long email like, hey, I am a helmet collector. Uh, I'm currently serving my military here and I'm, I, I'm, I've been collecting helmets forever. And, you know, and we began a conversation over several emails over a few days. And uh, he kept asking me, is the piece ready? You know, are you going to sell it? So I eventually negotiated a price. And he, when, I, when he finally got it in the mail, this guy was so grateful and wow. excited about it. He was like, dude, I've been looking for this. It's a show I used to watch. And I remember seeing this type of helmet and I finally have it. This is like an important piece to my collection, but just the appreciation for what I was trying to do. It yeah. was like everything. And we had like a really nice relationship through that. You know, it was, we negotiated a fair price 
And he was very grateful for what I was trying to do. So I was like, man, this, that was inspiring for me, you know? Yeah. And he helped me and I helped him. We both got a great, you know, great deal out of the whole thing. Yeah. And you're like, now Goody Vault has touched Belgium from Huntsville, Alabama. That's pretty sweet. Like, wow, that's so cool. I love it. (laughs) I love it. it. Something I've, I've seen and you just like touched on it, which is this idea of even your clients are more partners. Like you said, you both got something out of this, this deal, this sale. And I think partnerships across the board in yes. business are really powerful. When you think of your customers as partners, you can do a lot cooler stuff. I've also seen you, especially on Instagram, have done a lot of really cool partnerships with either other brands in Huntsville, other entrepreneurs in Huntsville, influencers coming into the store, sharing their experience. Why have partnerships like that been so important to you? And how have you gone about even like creating a plan around how to do them well? I guess the first thing is like, we cannot do everything alone. It's hard to come to that realization, (laughs) but I had to come to it like, you know what? I need help. Yeah. This person can reach people I can't reach. And I want to grow. I want to become better, you know? So I guess the partnerships have been like, important for me because guess what i'm exposing myself to a whole a complete different like audience yeah and in return they get access to my audience you know i guess the main thing is to make sure we're trying to do something that's well thought out that's meaningful and that's done well Mm -hmm. i don't always get it right but i'm trying to get better at it like i'm really excited about a a partnership i have with the local kids store here Um, they sell kids clothes and the Goody Vault would be having a rack in there of curated vintage clothing for kids. Wow. So, and it's cool. We've been talking about this for some weeks now, um, and we're, we're trying to make it have some depth and be well thought out, you know? So it's, it's amazing. And it helps both businesses because whether we like it or not, we need each other to survive. Like nobody's mm-hmm. in this thing alone. I'm here because people said good things kind things about me that has resonated with someone else. And now, you know, it's, it's helping me stay afloat. So when you have two businesses that are doing that for each other, guess what? Everybody wins, everybody gets to eat, you know? So yeah, I love the whole partnerships and collabs and I want to do more of that type of stuff. Yeah. I think it's so easy, especially in local retail to, look down the street and see other retailers doing things and start to feel the competition and jealousy and almost mm-hmm. animosity of like, I can't do that. And now you're my, my direct competition, but actually like the power of local retails often in people coming together. And what yes. I love the most about local retail is I think it truly has the ability to kind of shape and change culture mm-hmm. in a city and and even create new environments. And I remember when when you and I first connected uh, like months ago, and I have this weird connection to Huntsville, Alabama, because my husband works for the government as well. So he travels to Huntsville a lot because there's a large military base there. And when I think of Huntsville, Alabama, I don't necessarily immediately think of this like cool, hip, local retail community with a really cool kind of like lively and growing culture. But that really is what Huntsville is like. Tell us about uh, the city of Huntsville, the energy, the growth in it, and how retail and entrepreneurs like you have really like shaped that culture. For sure. Yeah. Huntsville is definitely a nerd town. Uh, but it's a good thing to be nerds. We need that. Yeah. Um, you know, we need that. So I'm really proud of Huntsville because as a young professional, you know, working through my twenties here, I was always like, man, we have nothing, nothing like that's going to keep me here. It's not exciting. Mm-hmm. You know, we need more culture. I mean, to have a real culture, you need various types of, um, uh, various things you need good food you need clothing you need entertainment you need arts you need more music you need a lot of it just to Mm -hmm. really make it robust for the city Uh, so right now this is like i'm super excited this is another reason i left my job 
because I could see the growth of the city and opportunities for ambitious people with amazing like ideas and plans that they want to begin to, you know, initiate. So yeah, I left. I was like, look, this is, I want to be like at the ground level Yeah. as the city grows, because now I think people are starting to see, you know, Hey, I want to, even though the cost of living is going up a little bit, it's still not as expensive as other cities. Yeah. Uh, when you have big companies starting to move to the city, like Facebook, they're opening, it's going to be the biggest data center here. It's a wow. lot of Amazon. It's a lot of businesses that are coming here because they see the opportunities as the city begins to grow. So, I mean, it's like electric, really. And, but you have to be like involved in whatever you do as a small business to really see the energy that's like building, you know? So I'm trying to ride that wave because it's a really supportive community. And like you, like you were talking about before, if you can't do it alone, you know, if, if you're about the partnerships and, and things like that, you can ride the wave together and it benefits the business and the city. So, I mean, I, I can't even put it in words. I'm like so excited about the city finally embracing like growth and, and, and change, you know, you have to change. If you want to really have a city that stands out, you got to let go of some of the old mentality and, mm-hmm. and kind of adopt some really inviting ideas, you know? Yeah. So, some, know. some I'm new excited. ideas. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I would almost push back on you and say, I think that you and the other small business owners and the entrepreneurs in Huntsville who saw the same opportunity that you did aren't just riding the wave. You guys built the wave and <laughs> you got to, you got to build it up and now you get to ride it. And like how exciting and fun to see. And I know before we hit record, you told me about some exciting news, some growth that you have in your business. Uh, if you want to, Share that if you want to tell us about your new exciting adventures with Goody Vault. For sure. Um, let me just say this first. Like it's as a small business owner, you can't make everything happen the way you want when you want it to happen. Mm-hmm. Some things happen naturally. And we it's important that I say that because we all try to like force things and it just doesn't happen that way. And of course, one of my like goals was to like eventually try to move somewhere and have more space and try to become more accessible to everyone. And now the opportunity has presented itself. So this summer, the Good Evil will be moving. We will no longer be subterranean, but we will be at the <laughs> ground level. So it'll be a lot more accessible for everybody in the community or people visiting to come by. We'll still be doing appointments, but now the shop will be open for people just to walk in. Um, and check the shop. So a lot more information coming on that. If you look on our Instagram and everything, but super excited. Thank God the time (laughs) has come, you know, where I can expand a little bit. Be above the ground and see the sun and all of the work you've done has, has led you to this kind of moment of success. There's so many things that are exciting about this. What is the thing you're like most looking forward to having this new location? I don't want to limit people being able to come to the vault. And that's been a struggle because it's hard to get there now. But, you know, I'm so grateful for where I am, where I've, where I've been since I started. But it's, it hasn't been easy for people to come by. So I guess the most exciting thing is people can actually just drive by, oh, pop in the vault, you know? Yeah. And I've been waiting for that because there's so many people that I want to connect with, that I want to see what we have, what's in the vault. So oh, I can't wait for people to be able to just drive by, you know, and check it out. I, I love it. And this is why I love you and your brand and your approach to everything is your answer to almost every question always wraps back around to it's the people and the connections yes. and the experiences. It's not, oh, we're going to get more sales. Oh, there's more foot traffic. It's no, I get to have more people come into the store And the more I talk to small business owners, the more I realize like that's the ultimate at the end of the day, that's the key. Yes. If you care about people and the connections you're making, like we were talking about earlier, everything else kind of falls in place. Like those sales will follow 
And I find it such an impressive way that you're able to kind of think through it when you made such a big risk. So I, one more question for you, and I'm so excited to hear your answer because I, I know that you have such a, a deep and profound way of thinking about things like this. Uh, this show being called Resilient Retail, I think you are the epitome of resilience in retail. You have built, helped build an entire culture in your city. You have helped build relationships in your city, create a community within your city. What does resilience mean to you? Hmm. Yeah, this is such, <laughs> I've been thinking about this question for so long. <laughs> it's a tricky um, question. It is, but it's no wrong answer. Yeah, Because exactly. I'm thinking that when I, before I respond, I'm just thinking about where, my first example of resilience actually comes from. And we talked about that a little bit before, but mm -hmm. it's, it's just, for me, I guess resilience is never giving up no matter what. Mm -hmm. It's that simple to me. It's never yeah. giving up no matter what. Cause so many negative things, so many things are going to hit us constantly, but you can't give up. And I think about my mom who's passed, and that's the main lesson I learned from her life was, you know, throughout her struggle with breast cancer, her goal was just to help provide for our family. And mm -hmm. she never gave up to the end. So yeah. that's like, I mean, that's my example right there. So, yeah, it's that knowing what you want and why you exist, especially in like a business sense. What are you trying to do that's bigger than selling and you have this very clear connection to this is my dream and I love to do this and I love to have these connections. And so it's that like never giving up on ultimately what the most important thing is. And that is just, yes. it's so powerful. And and I love that you have that example from your mom. And I know we talked a little bit before about how trauma in your personal or in your business life can go one of two ways. You could have kind of mm -hmm. shut down and said, that was so painful and hard that I'm going to give up. Instead, you went, that was so painful and hard, and it's going to make me have this superpower to connect with people and to chase my dream no matter what, because I've seen yes. what that looks like. Yes. Yes. I love yeah. it. That's exactly what it is. Uh, Emmanuel, I'm so happy that we were finally able to do this interview. Thank you so much for being on the show. I can't wait to, uh, hopefully I can come down and, you know, see the store and hang out and do more interviews together. <laughs> yes. It's an open door for you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm watching you keep up the excellent work. I love this podcast. Thank you. Thank you.